Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Evangelist Nick Garrett channel. I don't know if these are the top 10 strangest Bible mysteries. Maybe there's ones you have in mind that could be even stranger, but definitely the ones I picked out for us today deserve a second look. You know, sometimes you're reading something and you read it a second time and you kind of find yourself going, wait, what? What, what does this mean? What's there? Well, I got 10 of them today I picked out and I think they're awful strange. Number one. Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane praying. Some of the apostles are sleeping. Judas has made a deal with 30 pieces of silver to sell his man out. He comes into the garden with many, many Roman soldiers. I think it says legions. And they walk up to Jesus and Jesus says, who are you looking for? And they say, we're looking for Jesus, the Son of God, Jesus of Nazareth. And then the Bible tells us in John chapter 18 that as soon as he told them, I am he, they went backward and fell to the ground. Yes, you heard me right. What does that mean? Does it mean Judas fell to the ground? Does it mean all those soldiers fell to the ground? That's deep, right? It doesn't give us any more detail. It just tells us Jesus Christ says, I am he, and they all fell to the ground. Number two, the suicide of Jews, Judas Iscariot. Now, both Luke and John suggest that Judas betrayed Jesus because he was somehow possessed by the devil. He went to the chief priest and for 30 pieces of silver, he was going to sell his teacher out, call him rabbi, kiss him on the cheek. They were going to know who he was. But after learning that Jesus was actually going to be crucified, Judas had an attack of conscience. He tried to return the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priest and they wouldn't take him. One account says that Judas then went and committed suicide by hanging himself and that the chief priest took that money, went and bought a field for strangers who came into town and died to be buried like a cemetery. Now, later in the book of Acts, when Peter recounts this, he says that Judas bought the field himself and that he fell down headlong, that he has exploded and his bowels came out everywhere. The facts are the same either way. Judas killed himself. The field got bought. Judas ended up dead in the field. But those details are certainly interesting. Number three, right up to his time of death on the cross, many standing around the three crucified men on Mount Calvary mocked Jesus. As he was about to die, Luke tells us that about the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour that the sun was darkened and the veil in the temple was rent in two. Mark gives the account too. Matthew goes further telling us that there were also earthquakes and that there were rocks torn apart and rent in two, that graves were open and that many bodies of saints who slept were raised. Interestingly, Romans chapter 3 and verse 25 says of Jesus, whom God hath set forth as a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare the righteousness for the remission of sins that are past. When we take all these things together, this strange thing of these resurrection of saints and earthquakes and darkness and the sun, is it telling us that the death of Jesus Christ on the cross was enough of an atonement for the sins of the past and that God accepting his sacrifice and resurrection would deal with the sins of the present and the future. Something interesting to think about. Number four, Moses, back in the book of Exodus. He had freed the Israelites from Egypt, but times were tough. Lots of hunger and thirst. Hundreds of miles wandering around wars to fight the Canaanites. The people complained often and loudly. The book of Numbers gives a strange account of an event that's easy to overlook, but deserves a deeper look. To punish their ingratitude, uh, God sent what the Bible called fiery serpents to bite the Israelites, and it killed many of them. What were these fiery serpents? Or, I mean, we could logically presume that they were snakes, but you get the impression that they're like some kind of fire-breathing serpent. The people begged Moses to go to God and make the fiery serpents stop killing them. So God told Moses to build a fiery serpent and put it on a pole. 
So Moses builds a fiery serpent out of brass, sticks it on a pole, and if anybody gets bit, they just look at this, and then they'll live. What a strange account. What does it mean? We don't get more details. It goes on to tell us more about the conquest of the Canaanite tribes. Number five. In the book of Job, God describes creatures to Job that are clearly dinosaurs, specifically one that sounds like a Diplodocus or a Brachiosaurus. Listen to this from the scripture. Behold, now behemoth, which I made with thee, he eateth grass as an ox. Lo, now his strength is in his loins, and his force is in the navel of his belly. He moveth his tail like a cedar. The sinews of his stones are wrapped together. His bones are as strong as pieces of brass. His bones are like bars of iron. He is the chief of the ways of God. He that made him can make his sword to approach unto him. Surely the mountains bring him forth food where all the beasts of the field play. He lieth under the shady trees in the covert of the reed and fens. The shady trees cover him with their shadows. The willows of the brooks compass him about. Behold, he drinketh up a river and hasteth not. He trusteth that he can draw up the whole Jordan into his mouth. He taketh it with his eyes, his nose pierceth. That's pretty amazing, and it definitely sounds like he's describing a dinosaur. Now, number six, <clears throat> Jesus on a few occasions appears in the Old Testament very plainly. One of those times occurs in the book of the prophet Daniel. Daniel and his friends were threatened by the king Nebuchadnezzar for failing to bow to and worship this golden idol that Nebuchadnezzar had made. And when they refused, the three were set on fire. Listen to what the Bible says. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your God or worship the image of gold that you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar was furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and his attitude toward them changed. He ordered the furnace heated seven times higher than usual and commanded some of the strongest soldiers in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. So these men, wearing their robes, trousers, turbans, and other clothes, were bound and thrown into the blazing furnace. The king's command was so urgent and the furnace so hot that the flames of the fire killed the soldiers who took the three up and threw them in the furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar leapt to his feet, amazed, and asked his advisors, Weren't there three men that we tied up and threw into the fire, they replied? Certainly, your majesty. He said, look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound, <clears throat> unharmed, and the fourth looks like a son of the gods. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out. Come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire, and the satraps, prefects, governors, and royal advisors crowded around them. They saw that the fire had not harmed their bodies, nor was a hair on their heads singed. Their robes weren't scorched, and there was no smell of fire on them. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defied the king's command and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I decree that the people of any nation or language who say anything against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be cut into pieces and their houses burned into piles of rubble for no other God can save in this way. Number seven. On several occasions, Jesus tells people that Moses wrote about him. This has several important implications. First, Jesus verifies that he believes Moses wrote the Pentateuch, which has been in question among many scholars. Two, Jesus is aware of the prophecies written about him. 
Three, the references that Islam makes about the Prophet Muhammad being alluded to in the Holy Bible are accounted for. And talking about Jesus, he says so himself. It comes from John's Gospel, chapter 5, verse 46. If you believed Moses, you would believe me because he wrote about me. Number eight. In the book of Genesis, some strange things are happening right off the bat. First, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Well, later, modern science would develop certain necessities for life, such as time, space, matter, a creator. The very first verse of the Bible strangely has these. In the beginning, time. God created the creator. The heavens, space, and the earth, matter. Further, the second verse tells us that the earth was formless and void, and the Spirit of God hovered over the face of the deep. The Hebrew words used there are tohu vabohu. The only other place this term is used in Scripture suggests an existing place has been destroyed. This leaves the question that goes unanswered by most Christian seminaries. Is Genesis 1 talking only about God's creation from nothing at the very beginning? Or is it talking about God reestablishing the earth, recreating, perhaps after the fall of the angels? Number 9. The activity of demons in the early church period is alarming. Listen to this from the book of Acts. Then certain of the vagabond Jews, exorcists, took upon them to call over them which had evil spirits in the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, We adjure you by Jesus, whom Paul preacheth. And there were seven sons of one Sceva, a Jew, and chief of the priests, which did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? And the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped onto them and overcame them and prevailed against them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. The early church father Tertullian goes on to say, The Lord himself is witness that we have the case of the woman who went to the theater and came back possessed. Accordingly, in the exorcism, when the unclean creature was rebuked for having dared to attack a believer, he firmly replied, the spirit, and in truth I did it most lawfully, for I found her in my domain. Ooh, that is scary. Scary to know they have a domain. And number 10, finally number 10. One would expect that the Holy Bible contains the name or word of God in some form in every book, but that's not the case. In the book of Esther, which gives very important lessons and visions of living out faith and life and uh, the struggles of the Israelites, does not mention the name of God one time. Friends, there are dozens of more strange mysteries in the Bible. These are just 10 I found that maybe there's answers for, maybe there, there aren't. Let me know what you think. Tell me some mysteries that you think are real strange down in the comments. God bless you. May your work bear fruit. And I look forward to seeing you next time. Thanks.